well. I'm glad you know what to do. Good morning, Calvary family. So Kyle, it would be great if you'd turn your mic on every now and again so we can... <laughs> well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. Guess who's here to greet us and to be with us? The Spirit of the living God. Jesus himself is among us, and he calls us to worship. Revelation 15, it says this. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And this is that song that we sing today. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. For you and your righteous acts have been revealed. This morning we gather together to worship before the Lamb who is risen and who reigns on the throne forever. So church, let's join as we sing to the risen Savior. He alone is worthy.
Church, we're so glad that you're here this Sunday morning with us, that you've chosen to take some time out of your busy weekend to join us as we exalt our Savior through worship, and then later we open up to worship through the proclamation of God's Word. We're so glad that you are here today. My name is Kenan Wiley. I'm one of the pastors here on the team at Calvary, and hopefully I'm not the first to say this, but welcome. Good morning, and we're so glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us today. We have designed a special area for you today. So if you're a first-time guest, maybe you're brand new to Calvary, maybe you've been watching online and you're back in the room with us, we're so glad you're here. But if you're here for the very first time, our team and our staff and volunteers would love to meet you out in our Connection Hub in the lobby. We've put together a special gift for you just as a small token and way of saying thank you. And we are committed to helping you take your next step on your faith journey here at Calvary. One of the ways that we can worship this morning is through the way of giving. And across our exits as you leave this morning, we do have giving boxes posted. As well, you can worship through giving throughout the week. And you can go to calvary.us slash give to give up your tithes and offerings there. You know, one of the things that we like to foster here are relationships. One of our values is community. And so right now, I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet. Maybe you didn't have a chance to greet or welcome someone yet. So let's take the next 60 seconds or so, look out across the room, find a few new friends, and welcome them to Calvary Church today. We'll resume worship in just a moment. Well, good morning, church family. As you're making your way back to your seat this morning, we are going to go ahead and celebrate this morning with believers' baptism. Baptism is the opportunity that for those of us that have placed our faith in Jesus, that we display that publicly. It's a public declaration of our faith. In fact, it makes me think of Romans chapter 6 when Paul's talking about salvation and justification, and he pictures it through baptism. He said, were we not baptized into his death and raised to a new life. So when we celebrate baptism, we're celebrating what we just sang, the Christ crucified, raised to life and coming back again. And this morning we are going to celebrate with Sheldon. It's been a joy to get to know Sheldon and Justine as they joined into our church earlier this year. And they're jumped right in in groups and they're connected and they found a place to be their home. And we're so excited for them to be here. And this past weekend we had our tournament of tournaments and Sheldon called me afterward and said, Justin, I need to take the step of believer's baptism. He's grown up knowing the Lord in his life and, 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 and a few months ago made a commitment to go, I'm declaring that Jesus is Lord in my life. I believe I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died for me and I'm placing my faith in him. And then he wanted to get baptized as a proclamation of that faith. So Sheldon, I'm so proud of you and so excited this morning to be here with you. What is your declaration of faith? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen based upon the fact that you just professed Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him by death, and raised to walk a brand new life. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful thing that we get to celebrate nearly every weekend here at Calvary. Man, I'm so grateful. Well, let's stand as we continue to sing. We're a church that loves to sing. 
what we believe. So this morning, let's do this together. We just speak the name of Jesus. Addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. And your
God be praised. God be praised in all things. Lord, we ask, we beg 
that in the darkest reaches of the world and in each of our souls, that you would be the light that shines on all the things that are broken and hidden from others, but not hidden from you, Jesus. For nothing, nothing is hidden from you. All secrets, all desires, all things are known by you. This morning, I pray that we would open up before you and allow ourselves to offer you those things that are hidden, whether they be hurts and wounds and brokenness or sin, anything that keeps us, Lord, from fully surrendering and walking with you moment by moment, day by day. Lord, it's all yours, so have your way in each of our hearts, in those places. For you are tender and you are kind. You don't deal with us in the way that we believe you probably should. Lord, but it is your, your grace that reaches into those places in our lives, longing not, not to punish as perhaps we might punish, but to transform and renew and redeem that which is broken. So Lord, our redeeming God, redeem each of us today. Speak, Lord. We don't have it within ourselves to understand truth apart from your Holy Spirit. So God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would open up to us your truth as we read from your word and hear it explained, that you would reveal to our hearts, illuminate to us what we've been missing. Remind us of what we have forgotten. We ask, we beg, Lord, that you would speak for we, your children, are listening and we love to obey you, Lord. We love to obey you because there is there's health, there is security, and there is union with you in our response of obedience to your word. Let that be true of us today. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. as we begin this morning, it seems good to uh, have a special time of prayer. Many of you have asked, and of course, uh, uh, hopefully and expectantly, uh, knowing we should uh, pray. Uh, I know in the last uh, 12 hours or so, many of us have watched on our televisions and uh, on the internet about the uh, bombing uh, in Israel and uh, many speculations and uh, many anxieties. And of course, the Bible commands us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And uh, so um, I think it is good as we just take this moment as we begin uh, to uh, ask God's uh, help and to pray. So if you'll join me right now in just uh, that prayer. Father, our hearts um, are again full of many emotions, even anxieties, um, uh, burden for the people in Israel uh, who are suffering and undergoing attack even now. Lord, we know from reading your word that this is a part of a bigger story that has unfolded throughout history and still unfolds and is yet to unfold. But Father, we pray uh, for the nation of Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the
the leaders of Israel. And uh, we know that there are people suffering in war, in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Israel, in all these places. Lord, there is great suffering. And we yearn for the day when the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus himself, will come and reign. And your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray for that day. But Lord, in this day of war and turmoil and conflict, we ask for your mercy. We ask for your help. We pray for wisdom. We pray for our leaders that they may have wisdom and do the right thing. And uh, we just pray, Lord, seeking your help, your protection, and your blessing, and asking for your blessing and intervention in the name of Jesus. We pray it. Amen and amen. And I think in a way that that gives us a good chance to begin today. You're taking your Bibles, you're turning to John chapter 20, where we have been reading and will be for the next several weeks. John 20 and verse 19 in a moment. Um, People are are afraid of many things. Um, Maybe today you're afraid. Maybe you're carrying a burden or maybe there's just anxiety in your heart. Uh, You know, did you see the eclipse this week? I don't know if you saw the eclipse. It made all the news. We saw it. Uh, Somebody brought the funny glasses in our finance office so we didn't go blind. And we all went out, you know, Monday afternoon from various meetings and looked up. It's quite amazing to be able to see the sun, to see the eclipse. They say the next one over Florida is in 20 years. uh, And it'll be a full eclipse over Florida. I don't know if I'll be able to see anything in 20 years. uh, So I thought I better get what I could this week. But... um, you know, it's funny, people get nervous about that. And uh, maybe you saw stories, people were nervous. People, some people think it's the end of the world. Some people uh, uh, kind of go crazy. Uh, wars have launched in history. You can study it in history. Wars have uh, launched and some wars have stopped because of eclipses. And people have done crazy things. They've taken their own life. They've harmed themselves. They've done wild things. People sometimes see things and, and they just don't know how to process them. Well, I doubt you're afraid. You're much too grounded a group to be afraid of something like an eclipse. But what is it that causes anxiety in your heart today? Uh, What has uh, upended your world today? Well, John 20, verse 19 is a text we've been looking at and we started last week. It happens, this story, we're going to look at it for five weeks because here's the story. It's Sunday night, Easter Sunday. It's the evening of Resurrection Day. And uh, while there have been rumors and stories that have flown around, most of the disciples at this point had not seen for themselves that Jesus was risen. And the Bible tells us that night they're gathered in a room and uh, two things we know about it. The doors are locked and they are crippled with fear. The doors are locked. They they keep, you know, don't want anybody getting in. And the Bible says they're, they're afraid. They're paralyzed by fear. And that's where they are. That's where they are, hiding in a locked room, overwhelmed by fear. And Jesus shows up, the resurrected Jesus. And five things happen in that room that change everything. When these five things happen, the doors will be unlocked. Those overcome by fear will be overcome, overwhelmed with boldness. The doors will be unlocked. They will leave that room. They will go out and change the world. And so we've taken five weeks. We're just going to walk through five things Jesus gave them in that room. Last week, he gave them proof of the resurrection. He showed up, his hands, his side, and all the implications of the fact that Jesus Christ was the Lord, risen from the dead. He showed, touch me, he said. He ate with them. He gave them proof that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. It's a wonderful thing. It changed everything when you have your conviction and you know what is true. There's a second thing Jesus gave them, and we're going to look at it today. It's the first words that come out of Jesus' mouth, and it's the very thing that some of you need today to unlock the doors and to walk out with courage and boldness of whatever room you're hiding in. John 20 and verse 19 I want to invite you to stand as we do here at Calvary as a way of honoring the authority of God's word. And we turn to John 20. We look at verse 19. This is the word of the Lord. The Bible says, when it was evening on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. 
Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Father, may we hear the words of Jesus who stepped into that locked room of troubled followers and spoke words that changed everything. May we hear what they heard and may we be changed like they were changed is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. The first words out of Jesus' mouth when he stands in their midst, what a troubled group of men and women that was. Some hopeful, but they're, they're afraid. The Bible says there, it's used the word, they were afraid of the Jews. That's not anti-Semitic, they were Jews. What he's saying is they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, the Jewish authorities. They saw what could happen. The last few days they had seen Jesus crucified. They had seen all the things that uh, had just devastated their world. Their world is devastated. They're in the room. The doors are locked. Jesus appears. And this is what he says. Peace be with you. In fact, he said it twice. Did you notice that? Verse 19. It's the first words out of his mouth. Peace be with you. He says it again in verse 21. Peace be with you. It's the first words out of the mouth of the resurrected Jesus. Peace. Peace. Now, at one hand, you may think, well, that's a typical greeting. Jewish people would often greet one another by saying, peace be with you. And so some think, well, maybe Jesus is just showing up and saying, hey, how are you doing? Nice day. But you know, there's more than that. This isn't just a casual greeting. These words matter. In fact, Jesus said it twice as if they couldn't quite believe what they were seeing and hearing. And so he said it again, peace be with you, twice. Luke records the exact same thing. The first words Jesus spoke, he gave them peace. Peace is a powerful greeting. And what does it mean when Jesus spoke peace? What is peace? It's an important question because if you try to look at it in Webster's Dictionary or something, the, the definition will be somewhat unsatisfying. You know, what is peace? The absence of war, the cessation of hostilities. But that's not really what peace is. Peace is not the absence of a thing. Peace is the presence of a thing. It's not about something you don't have. It's about something you do have. If you were wishing someone peace, as like, again, a typical Jewish greeting would be shalom, peace be with you. If you were, what, what do you think they're saying? I hope you don't get in a fight today. Is that what they're saying? Peace be with you. I hope you don't get in a fight. That's not what they're saying. Like, obviously, it'd be nice not to get in a fight today, but they're saying we, we're praying something for you. Peace is kind of a, and again, lots of definitions. None of them do it justice. Peace is a sense of well-being, isn't it? It's a kind of inner contentedness. And again, that, no, that doesn't quite do it justice, but it's a something on the inside that you have. It's not just saying you're not in a fight. It's something you've got. And Jesus showed up, and Jesus spoke peace to them. What is peace? I think about it sometimes, peace. Sometimes people look at the past and they say, I have peace with it. I'm at peace with it. What do they mean? How can you look at your past and say, I'm at peace? It usually means, number one, you're grateful when you look at the past. You're grateful for all the blessings of God. So when you look at the past, you just don't see the tragedy. You just don't see the brokenness. You see the blessings. You don't just see the tragedy. You see all the things that God has done for you. And so you look back and you're, you're grateful. But it also seems that you've come to accept it. Like I've given it to the Lord. I, I don't understand it. I don't even like all of it. There are things in my past I wish weren't there. But I can, I, you know, if you've ever talked to somebody who's saying, hey, I, 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 I'm at peace with it. What do they mean? I, I look back with acceptance and with gratitude. What about when you look at the present? Someone's saying, sometimes we say, I'm at peace right now. And by the way, again, I can prove that peace isn't the absence of something. I mean, somebody could be, right now, they could have all the money in the world. They, nobody could, uh, is after their life. They have the finest security money can buy, surrounded by people with guns. And they might be in their living room of their mansion going, I have no peace. And you can have somebody's living in a war zone. They don't know if they're going to live to the end of the week. And they, they might tell you, you know what, I've got the peace of God. See, it's something you have. It's not something you don't have. 
And there are people, what does it mean when you look at the present and you say, I'm at peace? It means, again, you're grateful for what God has done. You see your blessings, but it, it's a sense of contentedness. It's a sense of somebody saying, I have everything I need to be happy. I have it, even though I don't have everything maybe I want, I'm at peace. It's a beautiful thing to be able to say, God, I'm at peace. Some of you can't say that today. I understand that. Yeah, what do you, when somebody looks at the future, sometimes they say, yeah, hey, I know, I don't, what's going to happen? I mean, people are anxious right now. Americans are anxious. We're anxious. The war, I saw people last night, I was watching it when I got home from an event and saw the reports and, and you know, people, is this the beginning of World War III? Years from now, will people say that's how World War III? I don't know. People are anxious. They're anxious about the election. Like, does anybody think, oh, when the election's over, everything's going to be good? I, I mean, it doesn't matter, like, which way it goes. Like some people think that's the worst thing in the world could happen if that guy gets elected. And other people say the worst thing in the world could happen if that guy gets elected. It's like, I mean, if they're anxious. What's going to happen? Anxious. How can you look at the future and say, I'm at peace? Well, because you have confidence that God is in control and you have hope, don't you? You have hope that no matter what happens... Listen, God is working a plan to good. That doesn't mean everything that happens is good, but I know that God is working and I know how it all ends. And so I have hope and I have confidence. And so there are people in the worst of circumstances who can say, I have peace. I have peace. My heart's broken, but I have peace. Like I'm troubled, but I have peace. Like I look at the past. I look at the present. I look at the future. I have peace. I have peace. Jesus stepped into a room of people who were troubled in a world that was troubled and they were surrounded by trouble and Jesus spoke peace. And let me tell you that Jesus was not saying everything is going to be, he wasn't saying, look, uh, you're going to have peace. Like when we talk about peace, like if, if you said, uh, uh, hey, I'm going on a, a cruise, pastor, I'm going on a vacation. I said, what do you want? I want some peace and quiet. <laughs> Amen. Anybody would like that? You'd like that, wouldn't you? There's some moms here of some uh, young uh, children, and, you know, they, sometimes they get away for a day or something. You say, hey, what are you looking for? Peace and quiet. <laughs> I know it. Nothing wrong with that. You know what they're saying? They're saying, look, I'm hoping for a day without trouble. Like, isn't that what you want? I, I just like a day of peace and quiet. Like, I don't want any knuckleheads bothering me. I'm not going to read any emails. Please don't bother me. No diapers to change. No problems. No criticism. Just peace. That's what you mean. Is that what Jesus is promising here? Now, it's a great way to have an afternoon. We all need a peaceful day once in a while. But is that what Jesus was saying? Think about it. These guys were in the midst of turmoil, trouble, and think about who Jesus was talking to. Most of them would die violent deaths, by the way. Peter would be crucified upside down. Andrew was probably crucified. Thomas was, others run through with a sword. All but John died violent deaths. So what do you think Jesus was saying to them when he said, peace be with you? Like, hey, guys, it's going to be easy peasy from here on out. Now, everybody's going to love you. Everything's going to go great. Everything's going to be easy. You're going to have a wonderful life, peace and quiet from here on. Is that what Jesus was saying? He wasn't saying that. So what was he saying when he gave them peace? Well, let's look at what Jesus did mean. In fact, let me give you another verse. Now, sometimes when the Bible looks like it's saying two different things, here's the key. If it looks like it's saying two different things, just believe them both because everything in the Bible is true. And sometimes you just need two things to help you understand the thing you need to understand. Look at this verse in Matthew 10, 34. This, here, this is Jesus, Matthew 10, 34. Look at this verse. Don't assume I came to bring peace on the earth. You go, wait, wait, wait. I, th I thought you were peace, prince of peace, peace on earth. I thought everything was going to be easy. He said, don't assume I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Jesus said that? You can look it up. I'm not making it up. I just, I don't make it up. I just tell you what he said. Now, you read the context. Here's what he's saying. You can hold, I don't have time to read the whole chapter there. But the context is Jesus is saying, I have come and uh, the truth that I bring you is going to force a choice. It's going to turn some fathers against their sons and some mothers against their daughters and some family members against one another. And I, what he's saying is, look, uh, I've come, but people are going to have to make a choice about Jesus. It's going to cause some conflicts. It's going to cause some problems. And if you want to follow me, you're going to have to be willing to leave everything, and you're going to have to come and follow me. Jesus was saying, I didn't come to make your life easy. Like, I didn't come easy. So here's what we need to understand. 
Jesus was not promising peace with the world. He was offering us peace in the world. And there is a difference between peace with the world, everything's going to be nice, and peace in the world. See, the disciples were in the midst of turmoil, and they were facing turmoil, and yet Jesus walked into that room of people who were crippled with grief and fear and said, peace I give you. That's what he offered them, peace. And that's what Jesus offers us. Not a life that is easy, not peace and quiet, not a life without controversy or chaos. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble He said, they hated me, they'll hate you. There is a difference between peace with the world and peace in the world. Jesus promised one, but not the other. You remember the story in Mark 4? There's a story in Jesus' ministry. You find it in Mark 4 where Jesus and the disciples are in a boat. They're sailing across the Sea of Galilee. A huge storm comes up, and they're frightened. They think they're going to drown, and Jesus is sleeping in the boat. They have to wake Jesus up. He stands up. He says, peace be still. And with his words, the winds and the waves calm immediately. And they were amazed, like, who is this? He can calm the wind and the waves. Now, maybe you read that story, and here's what you draw away from it. Some of you do. This is it. Jesus promised, I'm never going to have any wind. I'm not going to have any waves. Is that what he's promising? He let the disciples go into the storm. Like, could he have not told them the day before, hey, there's a big storm coming, bad weather, don't get in the boat. He let them get in the boat. He let them go into the storm. And then he showed them his power so that they would know even in the storms of life, there is one who can bring peace. Jesus brings peace. He didn't promise us a life without storms. He promises us his presence in the middle of the storm and the peace that only his presence can bring point of Jesus's offer of peace in that room in Jerusalem on that Easter evening was that even though their lives had been devastated, even though they were facing extraordinary opposition, even though their futures looked bleak and uncertain, and even though there is no peace in the world, Jesus' resurrection means that they can know peace in the world, even if there's no peace with the world. I don't know what storm you're facing. But I know what the resurrection of Jesus means. It means you can have peace right now. Let me tell you two ways Jesus gives us peace, promises us peace. Both of these in the Bible. Doesn't promise us peace with the world, but in the world we can have peace. And here's the two kinds. Number one, you can have peace with God. Peace with God. You don't want peace with the world. You want peace with God. And Jesus is the only one who can bring peace with God. Let me show you this verse. It's in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. It tells us how to have peace with God. It's right there. Peace with God. You want to know how to have peace with God? Right here it is. Therefore, now that means he's been talking about something and he had been building this case, but this is the conclusion. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you have peace with God? Look at, keep the verse right there. How do you have peace with God? Well, it comes through Jesus, but how do you have it? We've been justified by faith. Three words, justified by faith. How do you have peace with God? We are justified by faith. It says, it doesn't say that you have peace with God when everything's going great. You have peace with God because you go to church. You have peace with God just because uh, uh, you've done something good. No, it says we're justified by faith. Now, we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating. Justified is a legal term. Think of justice, just, justice, the hall of justice, people who work in the justice system, just. It means to be right. It means to do the right thing. So someone is justified if they have been found to do the right thing. Like, then they're justified. Like, if you look at somebody that's been accused and you go, hey, wait a second. Uh, It's not just that they're not guilty. That's what, in our system, you can get out of jail if you're not guilty. But that doesn't, by the way, mean you're innocent. That just means they didn't find you guilty. But justified means you look at all the evidence. And not only is a person not guilty, you look at them and go, oh, no, no, they're justified. They did everything they were supposed to do. They didn't just avoid doing something wrong. They, they are perfectly just. Boom, justified. Now, that's how you have peace with God. You have to be justified. 
By the way, it's past tense. It means God's already declared it. God already knows it. So justified. So all you have to do is be justified. You say, oh, great, that's easy. Oh, no, no, that's, that's terrible news. Because none of us would be justified. Like if it's up to us, nobody's just. Like, you think you're going to stand before God one day? He knows everything you've thought. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything. And he's going to look at your life and say, 1,000, bat at 1,000, perfectly just. Anybody here like that? Well, if you're, you're lying, if you think you are, you're wrong. You're right. Nobody's here like that. Because the Bible says there's none righteous, not even one. Nobody's just. Uh, I, I've used this illustration before, but I remember in the 1990s when President Clinton was the president. Some of you are old enough to remember that, and, uh, and uh, some of you studied it in history books. But in the 1990s, there was a big scandal. He was impeached because he had done something immoral, and some folks thought it was illegal. It was a big deal. And so they hired a special prosecutor, and they do this today still, you know. And, uh, and, and so the prosecutor, they had all these army of lawyers. And um, I'm not, I mean, I'm not defending the press. I'm just telling you what happened. I, I mean, uh, they hired an army of lawyers. And they do the investigation, everything. They talk to witnesses. They have a virtually unlimited budget. They go, they're smart people. They go after you. And when it was over, they wrote a book called The Star Report, named after the prosecutor. I bought it. I, I think I still have it. I don't know. Maybe I sold it in garage sale. I, I needed to check. But you don't want to read it. It's R-rated. They wrote a, you know... It, 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 it's like R-rated stuff written by lawyers, so it's a weird thing. And and um, but it was it was a big thick book, and and it's written and uh, about everything he did. And again, I'm not defending what the president what the president did was awful, and you know that's a long time ago. But they wrote it in the put it in the book, and I did think this. I thought, wow, what if what if somebody wrote a book on me? Like, what if they wrote a book on you? What if somebody had an unlimited budget and they had all the lawyers they could possibly get and they, they could look at everything you've ever done, they could interview whoever they wanted to interview, they could subpoena them, they could write it up, they could, like, they computer, uh, everything, they know it, they're going to find it, you can't hide it. Oh, I erased the browser, it doesn't matter, they're going to find it. Uh, well, I hid this, I hid that, no, no, uh, nobody knows about that weekend, no, no, they're going to know about it. And, and, they, and then not only are they going to know about it, they're going to write it in a book and they're going to put it out there for everybody to read. Your worst moment is going to be put in a book. Everybody's going to read it. You say, well, whew, I'm glad that's not uh, happened. Wait a second. You're going to stand before God one day who knows everything. Everything. He knows what's in your heart and mind that never came out of your heart and mind. Can you imagine that? I mean, I'm glad a lot of the stuff in here and here never came out. You know, some of that stuff, I'm glad didn't come out. At least God gave me that much grace. But the Bible says if you've lusted in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Now, is he saying lust is the same thing as adultery? Oh, no, it's not the same thing as adultery. The, the one has far greater ramifications than the other. But, but if, if what he's saying is the sin is already in your heart. The sin is there. God knows that. If you hated a brother... You've already committed murder in your heart. Now, is hatred the same thing as murder? No, I'd rather you hate me than murder me. I mean, it's two different things. But what he's saying is the sin's already in your heart. It, it, if you could look into the heart, the nasty stuff is still there. God can look at it all. He could write it in a book. And you're going to stand before him one day. And God's perfectly just. So what hope do you have? We're justified by faith. That's how. Justified, it doesn't say justified by religious works and justified by your morality, justified because you tried really hard, justified because you were sorry. I know you're sorry, but it's still there. You still did it. Just to, no, justified by faith. Faith is trusting in Jesus. Faith is that I realize I couldn't measure up on my own because nobody's righteous, nobody's perfect. So I come to a point in my life where I trust in Jesus. And God takes all of my sin and he put it on Jesus at the cross. And then he takes all the righteousness of Jesus and he credits it to my account so that when he looks at me, he doesn't see all of my unrighteousness. He sees the righteousness of God in Christ and he renders me just. And here's the listen, watch this. The verdict's already in. You know, there's great anxiety when the trial verdict comes in. No, no, God's already given you the verdict. Justify, it's past tense. So when you trust in Jesus, he has already rendered the verdict that we are just 
in his sight. So how can I have peace with God? You have peace with God, not because I cleaned up my act, not because I obeyed the golden rule, not because I followed the Ten Commandments, not because I'm a good person, because none of that could give you peace with God. Here is how you have peace with God. You trust in Jesus. That's the only way to have peace with God. When you go to stand before God, how do you know you're justified? How do you know you're justified? You believe in Jesus. That's all. You trust him. That's it. Like, what do you think? There's a certificate? What do you like? You want the church to give you a certificate? Uh, We can print up a certificate. Calvary Baptist Church says, in our view, this person's justified. First of all, we're not always right. We don't know everything. But I'll give you a certificate if you want. But you're going to lose it, right? You lose it. Like, you're going to stand before God one day and go, I got a certificate somewhere proving, uh, you know, it's like, you're going to look at your wife. I told you not to put that in a good place. I told you to keep it. No, no, no. You're going to stand before God and say, I trust Jesus. That's all I've got. I just trust him. We're justified by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, that's how you have peace with God. So you can have peace with God tonight. Today, when you trust him, you have peace with God. When you lay your head on a pillow tonight, you know, I have peace with God. When you wake up in the morning, I have peace with God. You might have indigestion. You might have the flu. You might go through tragedy. The world may cave in on you, but you can say, I have peace with God because I've been justified by faith through Jesus. Peace with God. (laughs) Number two, here's the second kind of peace. Jesus gives us peace with God. Number two, he gives us the peace of God. The peace of God. He says, the peace of God can be yours. Look at this verse. It's Philippians 4. Romans 5, 1, peace with God. Philippians 4, 6, the peace of God. It says, don't worry about anything. Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of you are worried about something? Like you're anxious. Some of us have been anxious. You're anxious anxious about getting sick. You're anxious about dying. You're anxious about the future. You're anxious about a job. You're anxious about paying the bills. You're anxious about the election. You're anxious about war. You're anxious. You're anxious. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition, that means request, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. Now watch this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. There it is. Peace of God. Jesus will give you the peace of God. How do we have that peace? See, the Bible's telling us there's an alternative to fear and worry and crippling anxiety to these men in the midst of turmoil and tragedy. Jesus gives them peace. How do we have the peace? It says to pray, doesn't it? How do you get this peace? It says pray. With prayer and petition, those are requests. With thanksgiving, in other words, be grateful for everything God's done. But take all the stuff you're worried about And take it to God in prayer and give it to the Lord. Ask God. He says, take everything you're worried about. And he says, prayer. Prayer is the way you get the peace of God. He doesn't say music. Music can be wonderful. It can soothe anxiety, especially when it is a form of prayer. It's very, very helpful. But it doesn't say, well, sing your way out of it. You can sing your way out of it, but then you'll be right back into it. Uh, It doesn't say through preaching. Preaching is important, grounds us in the truth, teaches us doctrine. God uses the foolishness of preaching to, you know, uh, yes, to to make the gospel known, but not not fellowship. Fellowship's wonderful. We need fellowship. No, no. Prayer. It says if you want the peace of God, then take everything you're worried about and pray about it. Take your request to God with thanksgiving, being grateful for all that God has done. Take it to God, and here's the promise. If you'll do that, the peace of God will be yours. The way to get peace is to pray. The key to overcoming anxiety is to pray. The key to overcoming worry is to pray, to trust God, to take your concerns and give it to God. Why is peace so important? 
Now, here's very interesting. He says, if you'll do this, the peace of God, then he adds this, surpasses understanding. Let me tell you about the peace of God. It surpasses understanding. Now, one way of describing that means the word surpasses means it's, it, you can't understand it. Uh, I've known people that have gone through great tragedy and they'll say, I have peace. And people on the outside, I don't understand it. And they go, I don't understand it either. I just know I prayed and God has given me a peace. I can't understand. I can't explain it. But God, so the peace of God, you can't understand it. It just passes understanding. Here's another way of looking at that word, though. I think it's equally true. And that is surpasses. The word surpass means it's more valuable than, it's more excellent than understanding. For instance, this, like, Pete, like, let's say God, I'm not saying God's doing this, but well, let's say God gave you a multiple choice today. On the one hand, you could have understanding, or on the other hand, you could have peace, but you couldn't have them both. Now, let's just assume that for a minute. So you're going through a tragedy. Your world's been devastated. You're frightened. You're anxious, whatever you're going through. And God says, okay, I'll tell you what this morning. I can help you understand it. Or I can give you the peace of God. You get one, of the, not both. Here's what that verse is saying. It's the peace of God that surpasses understanding. The peace of God's more important than understanding. And I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you. Now, everybody wants understanding. And by the way, understanding is a wonderful thing. You can pray for understanding. We seek to understand God. But you're never always going to understand God. Never. And I promise you, you're going to go through something where you won't understand God. And, but, and, and so everybody, when you're going through a tragedy, here's the first word you're going to ask, God, why? And I'm not fussing at you for asking it. Every one of us are going to say, God, why? God, why? And sometimes you're never going to get an answer to that question. Let's suppose God said, okay, I'll give you an answer to the question. You want to know why? Okay, sit down. I'm going to help you with it. Now, it's going to be a little hard because I created the universe and you can't even find your remote control, but I'm going to sit down and I'm going to explain to you. I'm going to, I'm going to explain to you. And when I'm done, I'm going to help you. You're going to completely understand exactly how this fits into my plan. Let me ask you something. Would it take away the pain? Would it take away the hurt? The empty chair is still there. If God explained it to you, is that going to solve anything? It may, it, I know it's what you think you want. Let me tell you what you need. You don't need understanding. And there's some things, let me just be honest with you. There's some things you will never understand. But let me tell you what you can have. You can have the peace of God. You don't have to understand God to trust God. You don't have to understand God to have peace with God. Jesus stepped into that room of troubled men and women, and he said, peace I give you. Peace. Jesus promises peace. And no matter what you are going through, and no matter what is happening in your world right now, let me tell you, because Jesus Christ is alive, you can know the peace of God. And here's what the Bible says peace will do. It will guard, watch this, your heart and your mind, what you think and what you feel, your heart and your mind will be guarded by the, the presence of peace. See, anxiety cripples your heart. Anxiety confuses your mind. You don't know what to think. You don't know what to feel. But when you have peace, it's like a sentry guard standing watch. And it guards your heart from all those feelings. And it guards your mind from all those untruths which could confuse you. And the peace of God can guard your heart and mind and keep you grounded in Christ. I know you want to understand. I get it. I want to understand too. But what you need today is the peace of God. And Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead, you believe that, right? Which means this, he's here. Like the whole point of that is he's alive, right? I mean, that his spirit is moving. He's here. Like, okay, it's real. And here's what Jesus says. I give you peace. I'll give you peace. There are things we will never understand, but we can trust God. When Jesus is alive, we can have peace with God. And because Jesus is alive, we can have the peace 
of God. In this world, you are going to have trouble. And some of you are there right now. Some of you are going through the hardest days of your life right now. Maybe these aren't the hardest days, but they're hard days. And you know, you've lived the reality. Jesus never promised us peace with the world. At least not till he comes, until he reigns, and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And I long for that day, don't you? No more sin, sorrow, sickness, death. And that day's going to come. But until that day comes, you can have peace in this world by having peace with God and by having the peace of God. So Jesus is alive. He's here. And here's what he says. To every troubled heart in this room, to every anxious person in this room, peace I give you. Peace I live with you. And if you can have the peace of God in the midst of the storm, in the midst of this world, if you can have the peace of God, then the door will get unlocked, the fears will dissipate, and the future that God has for you will be realized. But you must have peace with God and you must be filled with the peace of God. Now I want you to pray. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Just want you to pray right now. First thing I, I want to say is this. Um, I wonder if you need to know that you have peace with God. Do you know that? Like, do you know you have peace with God? And you don't have peace with God, again, because you, you did something, you checked off a box, you went to church, whatever. No, no, you have peace with God by faith in Jesus. That's the only way you can be justified. You say, well, I've cleaned up my act. Yeah, but you still made mistakes. And by the way, you clean it up. I promise you, deep down there in the crevices of your heart, we need the mercy of God. We need the power of God. So there's only one way, and it's to be justified by faith. And if you're here today and you've never been justified by faith, you've never had peace with God that comes through faith in Jesus, you thought you had to be good enough, you thought you had to go to church, you thought you had to try. No, no. You have to believe in Jesus to be saved, to trust him. And if that's what you want to do this morning, then why don't you tell God that right now? Why don't you just tell him? Say, dear God, I need peace in my heart. I need peace with you. I admit that I've sinned. God, I know I've sinned, but I believe what the Bible says is true, that Jesus died for my sins, paid for my sins, raised from the dead, so he's alive. So God, I'm confessing my sin and I'm asking you to forgive me today so that I can have peace with you. I don't want to be afraid to die. I don't want to be afraid of eternity. I don't want to be afraid in life. I want to know I have peace with you this day, tomorrow morning, for the rest of my life. I want it to be said, he is justified, past tense, already, the verdict is already in. So God, I'm asking you, forgive me and save me. I put my trust in Jesus this morning. And if that's your prayer, I want you to tell somebody today, tell somebody, make sure before you leave this place that you've prayed with a pastor or a volunteer or somebody in our lobby, somebody at the front of our church. I, I pray and tell somebody, if you're here with a friend, tell somebody today that you've trusted Christ and you want to follow him. Now, I know many of you are here today and you know the Lord. You have peace with God, but listen, do you have the peace of God? You say, well, if you knew what I was going through, you, you wouldn't even ask me that question. I, I don't, but God does. Look, here's what I know. I know some of you came in today and you, right now you are crippled with anxiety. There's fear. You're afraid of what's going on with your grandkids, your kids, your job, your money, your health, your future, whatever, your marriage, whatever. And I want to ask you something. Here's, do you believe Jesus is here? Here's what I want to ask you. Do you want peace? Do you believe that no matter what you're going through, he can give you peace? Do you believe it? Would you ask him? The Bible says you have to ask him. It, it, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, it means come and ask God to give you peace. Would you ask God to give you peace? 
So here's what I want you to do. I want you just to stand quietly to your feet. Team, come up here. We're going to sing a song. And here's what I want you to do. If, again, it doesn't say go to church to get peace. I mean, that's good. It says ask him. So if you're here, go ahead and stand to your feet right now. All, everyone. If you want peace, listen to me, listen to me very quietly. If you want peace, I want you to come stand here. I want to pray for you in a moment. I want to pray for everybody who says, I need peace today. I may have walked in here, I'm afraid, I have anxiety, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm devastated, I agree, I, don't, I want the peace of God in my heart. And I want you to come and ask God, ask God, and you can ask him while you're here, while you're kneeling. And then in a moment, I want to pray for everybody that comes and says, I need the peace of God. I want you to sing this song, Kyle. It's an old song. Here's what it says, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know that song? All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Listen, oh, the peace we often forfeit, the needless pain we bear because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So while we're praying, let's sing that song. Come, come, and we're going to ask God to give you peace. What a friend friend we we have have in in Jesus. Do you believe that? Come, say, God, give me peace. Do you need Our peace? Sins and I want to pray for you. To what a privilege, a to, privilege carry. to carry. That's good. Come. Everything to God in prayer. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, the peace. Oh, what peace we, we often forfeit. that next verse and you pray and I'll, I'll pray for you in a minute but you pray if God leads you to listen to this verse have we trials and temptations have we trials anybody and here got a trial temptation is there trouble anywhere is there trouble To the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows bear? Jesus knows our every To the Lord in prayer. Now let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Everybody's right here. Just tell God right where you are. You, if you want to do it out loud, you can. If you want to do it in your heart, you can. Whatever. But tell God right now what is troubling. Tell Him what you're anxious about. Name it. God, I'm afraid. I'm anxious. I'm troubled. Just tell Him. Now, Jesus, I want to lay it at your feet. I want to trust you with it. Just tell him. Oh, Jesus, I pray for these precious men and women, young people who are here. There's so much trial and temptation. There's trouble everywhere. There's trouble everywhere. And, Lord, there's so many of us are full of turmoil and trouble this morning right now god we feel it we feel it it's like it's like something suffocating our heart our joy god we need your help lord we know we're not going to have peace with this world there is trouble but god give us your peace in the world the peace that comes from knowing we are right with you and the peace of god that guards our hearts and minds Oh, God, give us that peace right now. Help us to trust you. And, Lord, I pray for a peace that will flood somebody's heart and soul today that will cause them to unlock the door and walk out of this room that they're trapped in and 
follow you and obey you. And people will say, how are you going through it? We'll say, I have the peace of God. I have the peace of God. Is there trouble? Yes, but I have the peace of God. God's given me peace. Lord, give us peace. From the resurrected Jesus, breathe those words into our life and give us peace. As I pray. Sing this hymn. Sing this hymn. Sing this hymn. Peace, peace like, like a river. Tendeth my way. You know this song? When sorrows like sea billows roll. the turmoil and trouble of the world. Give us a peace that is greater than our strength and our ability. Give us a peace that comes only from you. We take our request and we lay it at your feet. We ask you for the peace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord praise today. Hey, listen. You can sit, you can go if, be seated. If you need to pray with somebody afterwards, though, you could stay here and we've got pastors and deacons and volunteers that'll come and pray with you. If you need to talk to somebody about the peace of God, just hang here and we'll pray with you about what it means. Just stay close and we'll have somebody pray with you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next Sunday when we worship the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed.
This is who we worship tonight, Lord. He's the same, he's the same. Oh, how I need you, how I need you. You free the captives, you're free. Touch the lepers, then I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. You are the same God. Every change, oh, forever. We feel you now. You're the same God. You're the same. If it's bandaging the broken or washing filthy feet, 
forget the flower and all of their beauty. I don't have to wonder, you know what you're doing. Yes, that's true. So why would I worry at all? Cause you're faithful to supply. Let's just declare this together. Sing everything I need, everything I need. My Father has it, my Father has it. And every single time, the Lord will provide. That's right. My Father has it, it's my Father. Yes, I trust And look at the sparrow Barking for nothing No fear of tomorrow And what it will bring Oh, you were enough If I had you, I had enough To so Everything else it will be added. All that I'm needing, that's it. Yes, I.